to meeting, so uh, we have a few talks. And our first speaker in the afternoon is uh, Sun Yun Kang, uh, who's going to explain the Dharma modulation to us. Thank you for the introduction. And this is Song Yun Kang from Seoul University. And today I'm going to talk about a viable explanation of the Dharma modulation effect among several RIMP effective scenarios. As you know, around 23% uh, of the total mass of the universe and more than 90% of the halo of our galaxy are believed to be composed of dark matter. There are many evidences and candidates like CDM, neutrinos, WIMPs, etc. Among them, WIMP is the most popular model, so uh, worldwide effort is on the way to detect WIMPs. In the series of direct de detection, I'm going to explain Dama Libra experiment result uh, from their search of annulation modulation in their sodium iodine detector. Using non-relativistic effective theory, we can set the most general Hamiltonian density like this. Here, Cj tau is a coupling constant, Oj is an interaction operator, and T tau is Pauli matrix. Also, tau means isospin, and J means interaction type. For operators, we can set 14 effective operators using four parameters. Uh, the spin of WIMP as chi, spin of nucleus as n, and uh, transferred momentum Q, transverse velocity V. And here, uh, one coupling dominance at a time will be assumed. And then we can calculate event rate for especially differential rate. We can factorize it with two response functions, which are of WIMP and target nucleus, according to Hexton's paper. And we can also calculate the modulation amplitude SM in cos cosine transform of R. And we can construct chi-square like this. Uh, here is our result. In this figure, each model has two local minimum, lower one at lower m chi. And also in this table, all models yield an acceptable chi-square. And for exception of C7 and C15, the absolute minima is below or equal to that of corresponding standard spin independent interaction, C1, around 10 GB m chi. Among our researches, I want to focus on two things. First is the chi-square at large mass. Uh, as you can see in this plot, for most models, chi-square gives a steep rise at large m chi. This is due to the fact that uh, expected modulation is given by cosine transform of R, which is a function of V-min parameter, and turns to be negative when V-min is smaller than 200 km per second. Moreover, V-min is decreasing with m chi. As a consequence, when m chi is large, one may have a uh, V-min smaller than 200. It means that a uh, negative amplitude. However, uh, because all the measured data are positive, it implies that a uh, bad fit to the data in chi-square. Second is fine-tuning. Dama Libra used the sodium iodine detector, which means, two, which means two kinds of targets. Of course, there are differences between sodium and iodine. That is, uh, sodium contributes maximum around 2 keV, while instead, the term due to the iodine is steeply increasing. Therefore, uh, for standard SI interaction, C1 and C11, the iodine contribution is naturally enhanced due to the uh, dependence of cross-section on the square of atomic mass number. Therefore, we have to uh, tune the R parameter, which is Cn over Cp, to suppress the iodine. On the other hand, uh, for C4, 6, 7, 9, 10, and 14 are spin dependence type providing smaller hierarchy due to the cancellation between spins. And C4 and C8, their response functions are proportional to nucleon angular momentum content, whose effect on sodium and iodine similar. Therefore, there is no large hierarchy. 
while the others have different R to suppress sodium and iodine respectively. It leads to the conclusion that uh, compared to SI interaction the, for the other models, iodine contribution is less enhanced, therefore lower fine tuning is needed. Moreover, we have observed these uh, effective models for which cross-section is explicitly dependent on wimp incoming velocity, show different modulation phase at large m chi. However, all these models are excluded by the other dark matter searches, in particular xenon 1 ton or PICO 60. And here we uh, analyzed the assessment of sensitivity of existing dark matter search experiments up to dimension 7 operator using relativistic field theory uh, describing interaction with quarks and gluons. Here CDAQ and CDB are dimensional Wilson coefficients and I used the code direct DM to calculate this therefore I'm going to follow the same notation. For relativistic models here chi is the dark matter field and F mu nu is EM field strength tensor while Q denotes the light quarks, U, D, and S, this G represents the QCD field strength tensor. And also you can see in this plot which non-relativistic operator contributes to uh, corresponding relativistic ones. And here are our results. This cyan line means the EFD bound. Therefore, below this line, it is inconsistent with the validity of EFD. And this y-axis, this lambda tilde is an effective scale, uh, rolls as a lower bound, defined like this. For these figures, uh, we can divide it into two classes. First is dominated by xenon 1 ton and DS50 at, large, uh, at high mass and low mass, respectively. And combining with the table above, one can see that uh, their response functions lead to spin-independent case. On the other hand, the other case is constrained by Pico and Picasso at low mass. Uh, in the same way as before, their response functions lead to spin-dependent type. And there is one more thing I have to show you, is this. For Q63 and Q64, we can obtain their result fixing mu scale as 2TB and uh, using run DM code and assuming the axial quark current coupling is the same for all quarks at high scale. However, uh, although we included only dama, ze dama zero, which is an upper bound, not dama modulation, one can say that uh, dama is excluded here also. However, Proton flex spin dependent inelastic dark matter can provide a viable explanation of dama. The, the most problematic bound is obtained by xenon, germanium, and fluorine. While the spin of xenon and germanium is originated by unpaired neutron, both sodium and iodine has unpaired proton. It implies that if dark matter interacts with ordinary matter via Proton, coupling, proton spin coupling, we can evade these uh, bounds from xenon and germanium. On the other hand, this fluorine has uh, unpaired proton too. It means that only protonphilic interaction is not enough. In order to evade this uh, fluorine bound, we propose inelastic dark matter. In IDM case, the two states with little mass difference are assumed. This light state is the dark matter, and heavy state have decayed by now. And the elastic scattering of light state is forbidden, while only the upscatters of lighter one to heavier one are allowed. This uh, leads to minimum value of wimp incoming speed, this V min star. And taking into account the target mass, this Freeman star of fluorine is larger than escape velocity, which means that rate vanishes. On the other hand, uh, because sodium and iodine, both of them have 
uh, V means star smaller than escape velocity. The Dama signal is still okay. Furthermore, when V star is larger than escape velocity, as shown in this figure, rate vanishes because this V mean is required to deposit some energy. For elastic case, V star is zero. However, for inelastic case, V star is larger than zero. Therefore, some targets, such as fluorine, may have V mean star larger than escape velocity, which leads to vanishing rate. Here is our figure with an assumption of Maxwellian velocity distribution. It is hard to reproduce the data because the energy spectrum in the, uh, of the modulation amplitude measured by Dama is monotonically decreasing, while inelastic scattering predicts the maximum in the spectrum for the same kinematic condition to suppress the fluorine. As a consequence, uh, chi square of Dama puts the low value of delta entering in conflict with this equation. However, in hollow independent approach, we can explain Dama. In hollow independent case, this event rate can be factorized with a hollow function. And due to the rotation of the, of the Earth around the Sun, we can approximate eta tilde and its average eta tilde bar like this, which lead to this figure. And as you can see, Dama is not excluded. And during our research, we included cosine 100, uh, who used the same sodium iodine target as Dama. They have published their exclusion plot for elastic SI interaction. However, this cosine 100 does not exclude Dama's uh, PSID, PSIDM scenario due to the modulation fraction. In particular, Modulation measured by Dama is around that uh, level of 0 0.02, while cosine has upper bound 0 0.13. And when we calculate this SM over S0 of Dama, it, its value is larger or equal to 0 0.12, where this S0 cosine over Dama is around 0 0.8 due to the energy resolution or efficiency of, their, of the two experiments. And here for SI case, this modulation fraction is smaller than this such bound. However, PSIDM scenario has higher modulation. Uh, this, this explains why uh, cosine 100 does not exclude PSIDM in hollow independent approach. And in, in addition to that, uh, we extended our analysis by calculating event rate using matrices. Here, C is a coupling vector, including all couplings and interferences. And this X is a real symmetric matrix, encoding all experimental information. And putting upper and lower bound of Dama and the other experiments, the compatibility between them is only achieved in the, uh, in, in the coupling constant parameter space, intersection between these two ellipsoids. To solve this, we found a set of real parameter psi, which makes uh, this psi a minus b positive. So uh, using total 27 matrices, we found the extreme, confi extreme configuration in this uh, table. And once we fix the, the C0 eisenvector, we can calculate a cross section and n sigma. Here, n sigma means the maximum standard deviation away from the measured value. And this is the main figure of our, this result, uh, this analysis. One can see that uh, upper bound for elastic one and lower part for inelastic one. As you can see, compared to elastic case, inelastic case has smaller tension of N sigma. And this, these bands uh, are due to the dependence on astrophysical parameters, V0 and UESC. When we, when we plot N sigma on M chi delta plane, uh, you can see once again the dependence on the different astrophysical parameters. And to suppress the fluorine, it is only valid between the, this red dotted line and blue dashed line. 
this situation is uh, very similar to PSIDM. And also we can plot the M chi and sigma plane. And here for all three cases, this extreme configuration lies on the intersection between xenon and PICO60, which are evaded by PSIDM scenario. Therefore, uh, I would like to say there is still possibility of explaining gamma. Uh, here are conclusions. Non-relativistic effective models can fit the DAMA data with less fine-tuning. However, all these models are excluded by fluorine and xenon detectors. And also WIMP quark and WIMP gluon interactions exclude upper bounds of DAMA. However, uh, PSIDM can provide a viable explanation if WIMP velocity distribution departs from a Maxwellian. And also in the non-relative state effective theory parameter space, inelastic scattering partially relieves the tension between the DAMA and the other experiments. At last, I want to advertise one more thing, the WIMPDD, our new code. This is a Python code for direct detection, implementing experiments by providing energy resolution, exposure, and efficiencies, etc and different forms handling large numbers of response functions. It is valid for any velocity distributions of WIMPs and arbitrary spins. Still, we, have to, we, are going, we, are, we are working on this code, but I think it will be coming soon. So please stay tuned, and thank you for listening to me. So you are asking me the dependence on mu scale? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, first is what's the meaning of the mu scale? Uh, this is uh, relevant to the uh, propagator. And uh, first we uh, did a uh, kind of test with the default value as uh, z boson mass. And if we uh, fix mu scale to 2 TV, then this uh, EFT bound can be strengthened. So we tried that to extend the mu uh, We tried to the increase mu scale, but uh, the bottom line is that if we, uh, although we increase the mu scale as 2 TV, but the DAMA is excluded and uh, the most constraining experience does not change. So inelastic the conditions. inelastic uh, model yeah. seems to be still with, uh, within the bound, right? Uh, yes. So uh, what does it suggest about the dark matter physics if uh, the conditions are inelastic? Uh. Does it suggest anything about the dark matter physics? Oh. Yes, uh, what I wanted to say is uh, if we set a kind of model with inelastic condition, then there is a possibility of explaining gamma. That was my point. Any more questions? So you mentioned the halo independent case. Yes. Um, what do you mean by that? You mean that instead of assuming the normal isothermal sphere, you let the velocity distribution be free? Mm. Uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, as a default, we uh, use the, we assume the velocity distribution as Maxwellian. 
but we cannot explain in that uh, scenario. So we uh, wanted to uh, make it depart from Maxwellian. So how, how extreme are the departures from Maxwellian? I mean, would they um, agree with the velocity distributions that you expect in other types of halos, like, I don't know, NFW halo or something? Mm. Mm. So I'm sorry, I can understand what's your point, but uh, after some slides, I showed you some uh, dependence on these astrophysical parameters, and also the, uh, I think, um, mm, we drop the Maxwellian velocity distribution, then the possibility appears. That was my point, actually. Yes, but so my question is, uh -huh. um, in order to make it work, sorry. Yeah. Um, in order to make it work, yeah. do you have to tune the astrophysical parameters within a realistic range, or um, would it have to be a crazy halo? Uh, no. So which 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 feature of the halo that you uh. change makes it fit? Uh, uh, actually. Uh, I concern the, the rotation of the Earth, and uh, it's uh, something like that. Uh, when we calculate the event rate, we can factorize it with two parts. One is the uh, response function, and the, and the other part is the astrophysical part. And if we, uh, uh, we, can, con if we can control this astro part, astrophysical part, then uh, I think we can get some more fit, more possibility. Thank you for waiting for me. Uh, that sounds clear? Uh, OK, thank you. <coughs> uh, so in this morning, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we have, we heard, we, we, uh, we joined, uh, we, constant, uh, we had joined the, to the lecture about uh, cosmic micro background, which is one of the pillars of the modern, of modern, modern cosmology. And from now on, I wish to talk about my recent work related to uh, supernova cosmology, which is another pillar of the co modern cosmology. So the title is over here. So it's about model independent constraints on type 1A supernova light curve hyperparameters and reconstructions of the expansion history of the universe. So this, this work was done by me and supervised by Professor Arman Shafilu in um, uh, in Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute, and also uh, he's the professor in U University of Science, Science and Technology, and he's, he's uh, also the senior researcher in CASI. 
So and this was and the co there are two other co-authors. They are and they are Ryan Kelly and Benjamin Luigi. So uh, this work, uh, uh, the the a paper about the paper about this work is uploaded on archive, and you can see the archive number over there. So this paper was uploaded last month. So. <coughs> So there are, many kind, uh, there are many different kinds of supernova in the universe, and among them, type 1A supernova are commonly used as standardiz standard standardizable candles for distance measurement, and they have become one of the import important portion of the modern cosmology. But to use them as standardizable candles, their light curve parameters should be constrained. So you can see their specific light curve, and so you can see that there are they shows the uh, typical light curve and uh, light curve when they when, when we measure the, their light curves, when uh, we the light curve uh, type one is supernova, but and we can uh, we can fit uh, we fit those light curves uh, um, based on certain fitting model, and we can constrain the parameters in the in that fitting model, so. We sh and we should so we should con uh, to, to use uh, type one supernova to di uh, to measure distance. We should uh, constrain those parameters first, and these Likert parameters are usually constrained based on assumption of certain model, fitting model or cos cosmological model. So they are highly model model dependent. So that's why they are called standardized standardizable candles rather than standard candles. So if someone can uh, suggest the way to constrain these, these light curve parameters in model independent way, or if someone can test uh, the uh, commonly used uh, any commonly commonly used fitting uh, model uh, fitting, uh, fitting models and check if they are reasonably independent to any cosmological model or uh, cosmological model. Then we can, then we can see that, and they can, with them we can ensure that uh, this uh, supernova cosmology based on them are quite um, are more real, uh, are are quite re reliable. Okay. So to do uh, so, and that's what we try by using certain uh, certain model, uh, certain way to reconstruct uh, reconstruct the distance modulus and derive from the uh, a type one supernova in modern independent way, and to do uh, to do that we use a data uh, named joint light curve analysis, which is not re uh, which is not most recent, but have uh, supernova type one supernova light curve parameters information, and uh, uh, light curve parameters information, and they are based on Salton model, and. So we choose this uh, this data rather than more recent Pantheon data because they have like parameter information. So, so based on this information, and so they provide observed B band peak magnitude, stretch, uh, stretching of the light curve, supernova color at maximum brightness. So based on this uh, information, uh, we try to reconstruct the distance modulus from these. Uh, from the type one supernova listed on this uh, uh, listed on this uh, compilation, and uh, uh, and try to uh, constrain the light, uh, try to constrain the light curve parameters in more independent way. So, uh, so I will give more explanation about the light curve parameters. So you can see this equation, which is for derive. Uh, which is uh, commonly used for deriving um, distance modulus from the uh, from the light curve uh, light, uh, from the light curve information. So this small m b star indicates observed b band peak magnitude, and x one indicates stretching of the light curve, and c indicates supernova color at maximum brightness. And all of these information are included in uh, JLA. So we can use, use we can use them to derive distance modulus. The problem is uh, there are other parameters. So th these parameters are called usually called light curve nuisance parameters, but it, it is also be called uh, as light curve hyperparameters. So we decided to call it hyperparameters 
and those hyperparameters are alpha and beta, which are proportional factors of x1 and c, and mb1 and delta m, which are which ha which I have information about absolute b band peak magnitude. So, uh, if the host uh, host uh, if the stellar mass of the host galaxy of of the, of the uh, type one supernova is lower than 10 to 10 uh, solar mass, then we can we can deci decide the uh, absolute uh, B-band magnitude as just uh, equals to mb1, but we need to add delta m if the, if the host mass is larger than this one. So these four parameters need to be constrained to use the light curve uh, parameter information to derive uh, distance modulus and measure, the dis and measure distance. So um, to d uh, constrain the parameters, I uh, hyperparameters I just showed, uh, sh showed in the previous slide, in more than independent way, we use uh, iterative, uh, iterative smoothing method uh, suggested by, um, uh, suggested by Shapiro in 2006 or Shapiro in uh, 2007 and so on. So this, this, met so this method is the w one of the uh, non parametric method to reconstruct distance modulus and expansion history of the universe. So, so uh, uh, we can, uh, we can I can briefly explain this mo method by like this. So it starts, uh, this method starts from initial guess of distance modulus. So this initial ca guess can be certain, uh, this can be uh, prediction of distance modulus from certain cosmological model or any kind of uh, just guess. But anyway, it start, uh, starts from initial, any, uh, initial guess of distance modulus. And, uh, uh, after multiple iterations of like, certain, uh, uh, this, uh, the process shown on uh, this, these two lines, uh, it generates model independent reconstruction of the distance modulus with lower chi-scale value, like a chi-scale value. So, so this initial guess can be model dependent or not. But after numerous iterations, it generates model ind independent reconstruction. This is the key uh, feature of this um, iterative smoothing method. And, and also it produces reconstruction with lower chi-scale value than original initial guess. So uh, to uh, do this uh, process, uh, to, to do this iteration, we need, uh, we need information, something like inver inverse of covariance matrix from JLA, uh, and inverse of, uh, uh, something like covariance matrix of the, the data, data of, of uh, type 1 supernova compilation. So uh, JLA also provides this information. So we uh, derive the inverse of the covariance matrix and then put it into the process. Then we done this iteration 1,000 times so that we, con re we produce a reconstruction which, which can be considered as uh, reasonably more than dependent. And also, we can calculate the chi-square value by using uh, covariance matrix from JLA and uh, uh, residual of, uh, residual of uh, distance modules from the, uh, from the reconstruction and re distance modules from, uh, from the data. So you can see the equation over here. I'm not sure you can, if you can see this clearly, but so, uh, uh, we reconstructed the distance modulus, just as, show, uh, as shown on this slide. And then we choose three different cosmological models to compare them with the, with the reconstructions. So we choose uh, lambda C, uh, the standard lambda CDM model, which have the equation of state parameter equals to minus one. So it, always have, it is always minus one, uh, uh, regardless of redshift. Uh, in an, on, on, on lambda CDM model. And we also choose uh, CPL parameter variation of dark energy, which add, uh, which uh, parameterize the equation, state, equation of state parameter of dark energy into two parameters. So one parameter is just a constant term, uh, another one is, has this term. So this was suggested by Chevalier and, and Polarski and Linder 
So that's why it, call, it is called TPL parameterization. Another one is uh, less famous than these two, but which is quite radical. So it is called phenomenologically, uh, phenomenological emergent dark energy model, which was suggested by uh, Li Xiaolei and Arma Shafilu in 2019. And the main, main point of this, um, so it, this model claims that, uh, suggests that the dark, en uh, dark energy uh, uh, was not effectively uh, 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 was not uh, effectively uh, present in the in the past, but emerges uh, in in late on later time at later time. So you can see that uh, this claim is quite radical, and you can see this equation. Uh, you can see that you can also see that this equation also radical. So you can see the equation of three parameters. Um, shows this uh, kind of terms and become uh, and, 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 and this uh, parameter emerges as, uh, as the redshift decreases. So we choose these three, uh, three different models to compare them with the re uh, modern dependent reconstruction we produced. So for the last model, yes. Uh, no, uh, there's no, uh, the w one of the main feature of this model is there is no uh, additional free parameters. So, so by using M uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo method, we trace the parameter space of uh, these four Likert like, like hyperparameters, then, and, uh, and we constrain the, these four parameters. So, you can see the red color, which shows the uh, con contour for, uh, for reconstructions. And other three, col uh, three colors shows the contours for three, uh, from, uh, for three different models. So blue color is lambda CDM, green is CPL, and cyan, co cyan color is Petty model. Uh, first of all, you can see that the absolute B magnitude is not well constrained for reconstruction, which is because uh, the type 1 and supernova data alone can constrain the Hubble constant. And this parameter is highly, uh, hi uh, highly affected by Hubble constant. So, but for other three different models, we can select certain value of Hubble constant. So it looks like that they are well constrained, but actually for model independent reconstructions, uh, the Hubble constant can be constrained well so that MB1 cannot be constrained well. So uh, that's why the uh, con contour for reconstruction is very broad. So this one is not really uh, important, but you can see that for other parameters, uh, the contours of uh, the con uh, constraints for these like hyperparameters are uh, but from three different models and, and model independent reconstruction are in good, a good agreement. So which means, they are, so they are, which means that the distance modulus uh, constructed by, uh, distance model constructed, uh, constructed from JLA data are quite, uh, are reasonable, uh, are mostly model independent. Also, uh, we uh, divide the reconstruction data into two redshift bins. One is low redshift bin, another one is high, high redshift bin. And the red one is uh, you, uh, uh, contour for whole J JL data. And you can see that the contours from low redshift uh, JL data are, are uh, almost the same with the JL data, uh, uh, almost the same with the contour from, uh, from all of JL data. And the contour from high redshift bin has has much larger size of contour and quite uh, and somewhat deviated from other two contours, but still, uh, but not that not statistically significant. So, it's, so, uh, so they, uh, their size are large and looks quite uh, deviated, but statistically they are not significant. So we can we, we cannot. Con con so we, c we can see that 
uh, there is no significant uh, redshift evolution, uh, uh, evol uh, significant el evolution of these light curve Harper parameters uh, with respect to redshift, but at least we can see that uh, these results are mainly uh, uh, determined by uh, low redshift data. So, uh, by to summar uh, so we can summarize this part as like this. So constraints from reconstructions and predictions of three different models are consistent with each other. Or, may, or more radically, we can just say that they are the same with, with, with each other. And second, the distance model I constructed from the JL data are mostly independent of the cos cosmological model. And the light curve, parameter, uh, light curve, parameter, uh, light curve hyperparameters are constrained mainly by the data, including the low ratio data. So then we uh, pro uh, proceed to the next part, which is about uh, exploring possibilities of the expansion history of the universe uh, with higher likelihood than that of, C uh, lambda C uh, that of the lambda uh, standard lambda CDM model, which means so uh, we already uh, produced the reconstructions from the JA data, and then we try to uh, pr uh, pr uh, explore all possibilities which can be uh, 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 possibly which can be produced by the re uh, by the reconstruction I just uh, introduced. To do that, uh, we reconstruct expansion history of the universe on parameter traits of like hyperparameters explored by using microchip Monte Carlo samples, and we also reconstru reconstruct the parameters which describe that not only the uh, ex expansion history, but also the parameters which describe the dark energy properties, and then we compare them with the predictions of these three different models. So on, you can uh, this figure shows the dis uh, distribution of chi-square from reconstruction and other three different models. So you can see that the red color, so chi-square, uh, chi-square, uh, chi from uh, reconstruct the distance module use uh, shows this, this distribution and most of them have chi-square values lower than the lowest chi-square value from lambda CDM model, uh, of lambda CDM model. So we choose only this, uh, these reconstructions. The chi-square, uh, the reconstruction which have chi-square value lower than the best field of lambda CDM. So we reconstruct, reconstructed not only expansion history of the universe, but also the deceleration parameter and own parameter, which was suggested by Salani Shafil and Swarovinsky in 2008. And we, we, choose, we also choose these parameters since this parameter is useful to test lambda CDM model. So we decided to repro uh, reconstruct uh, these three parameters and uh, distance modulus. And you can see their distribution like this. Uh, I wish to mention that the, the distribution of this re, uh, reconstruction shows their flexibility, not the deviation from this blue color, lambda, best fit lambda CDM. So their, uh, so, their de, de, so their distribution does not show that they are de deviated from the lambda CDM model, but they have uh, the possibility as broad as the, uh, this, uh, this area. So you can see that lambda CDM is included in, the, in their possibilities, not only here, but also in expansion history, own parameter, and uh, deceleration parameter. So you can see that this reconstruction, uh, uh, the possibility of this reconstruction are, shows quite, uh, uh, shows high flexibility. So we can uh, see that the reconstructed expansion history of the universe and parameters which describe properties of dark energy seems to be in good agreement with the prediction from the standard lambda CDM model. And they, they, are, uh, they, are, they show considerable flexibility. So to summarize these two results, uh, 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 so I will summarize these two results like, uh, on these three sentences. First, uh, constraints from model independent reconstructions are in good agreement with predictions of three different models. Which means the distance model I construct, constructed from the JL data are mostly independent of cosmological model. 
And the reconstructed expansion history of the universe seems to be consistent with the prediction of the standard lambda CDM model with considerable flexibility. So thank you for your listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. B uh pardon please? You said something like B band B magnitude. Ah B band magnitude. So okay, I'll show you the slide. So okay. I think so are you asking about this parameter or this parameter? possible the uh, meaning of the uh, meaning of both meaning of the design. okay so there are many uh, so there are uh, different uh, so there are different bands of uh, uh, color index when we when we um, when we observe the uh, when we observe any objects in the universe so b band is one of them so V band is, uh, I cannot. Pardon? Frequency band for observation. Oh yeah, we can call it yeah some uh, frequency band yes. So yeah, so you you can uh, so it is it is somewhat close to the blue color, but uh, so it corresponds to that that, that those part uh, and that those part anyway, and the uh, peak magnitude means that. The type one, when, when there's a, a type one uh, supernova, including type one supernova, it shows a light curve, something like, looks like a mountain. And so it, uh, how should I, dramatically it, it increases, and then, uh, how should I say, uh, slowly decreases. So, and there, is a, there should be a peak. So peak magnitudes means that, that the magnitude of the super, uh, type one supernova on, on the peak. So it means the magnitude, uh, magnitude uh, of type 1 supernova when, when, when it was in the peak uh, in B band. And absolute means it's absolute, man, uh, it, it's absolute value. Anti-correlated. Okay, so ah. But the, when you see the beta alpha correlation, there's a no correlation at all. Okay. For the first column, second one. Mm -hmm. so, but when you're looking at the beta in case, uh, beta m and beta, it also looks like uh, no correlation at all. Mm. So why that the because what's the meaning of that? The beta m one case in the the third row means there's no correlation. You cannot find any correlation for the different parameter, like the alpha, beta, yes. beta, and one. Okay. But when you have the massive case, you can find some correlation in the alpha and beta, either the delta m. So it means you have a better constraint for the model construction for the massive cases, or what's the meaning of this plot? 
Mm, first of all, uh, I'm not sure if it shows uh, uh, statistically clear anti-correlation. So I'm not sure if we can, uh, we can, we can surely think in what you what you said. So. Uh, uh, the beta is related to the, the maximum uh, brightness. Yes, and uh, the, the stretching. Yes, stretching and color. Right. So why? If that one is a correlation with the uh, M, means your the analysis for the the brightness, the light, light color, light color, is uh, some correlated uh, error. For me, it looks like uh, without any correlation, it's better. Because the alpha beta is uh, nothing to do with the absolute magnitude. Yes. It shouldn't have any correlation. If the okay. uh, parameter radiation is correct. But now every data has uh, some correlation with the difference from the. Because the alpha and beta is a coefficient for the. Nothing to do with the absolute magnitude. The kappa and E. I find that oh, yeah, yeah. for the X and the C. Yes, yes. So it shouldn't have any correlation. So, so, so you mean uh, alpha or beta should not be correlated with delta M? Is that yeah. what you mean? Okay. But it seems to be a correlation, anti-correlation with the alpha and the delta M. So you're talking about this contour, right? Right. Yes. So <sighs> Maybe, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I cannot uh, give you a clear answer about that right now, but maybe I can try to check if these parameters really shows significant anti-correlation. It's so not the same, as you can see, the elliptics is the direction. Yes. You have anti-correlation. Yes. The circle beta is a Q of circle. Yes. It means that there's no correlation. So beta is good, but the alpha case, you have the I think it might be simply because of uh, some uh, yeah, that's because later, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Can you go to the previous slide? Yes. Uh, sorry, the next slide. Okay. <laughs> Ah, okay. I'm sorry. Yes. So when you split the um, supernovae by redshift, yes. you were saying that the constraints on the hyperparameters come mostly from the low redshift. Yes. Do you have the same number of supernovae in both redshift bins, or is that just because there are more low redshift supernovae than high redshift supernovae? Uh, actually, uh, the low redshift have more than 600 high bony super, supernova in the, in the redshift bin, and high redshift bin have much lower than that, just slightly higher than 100. So, okay, so it's not surprising that the, that the, um, yeah, the size of the... Is, is much larger than the red one. Yeah, that did, did, did you try um, choosing the uh, low redshift, high redshift bins such that both bins contain the same number of supernovae yes. so that they have the same um, statistical weight. Yes. Do you still see an effect like that? Uh, yeah, I tried that, but one problem is if in that case, the size of the two redshift beams become too different. So, I mean, the size of the high redshift beam becomes really large. So it becomes, so the lower value of 0 0.65 becomes something like 0 0.3. So it becomes not, not really appropriate to compare, be, be, compare both. I mean, 
then because Okay, I'll see. Uh, I'll see the trend again. Does it work? Oh, yeah. So first, I thank organizers for having me here. Uh, in this talk, uh, I'll talk about the uh, basically late decaying dark matter, uh, which is kind of alternative to the usual uh, cold dark matter paradigm. And Alpino Gravitino is the one of the uh, particle physics realization. And uh, just for the student, uh, I uh, prepare the uh, acronyms. The LP uh, stands for action like particle basically very light and feebly interacting scalar particle. And Alpino is a Suji partner, so the fermion uh, partner of the action like particle. And it only rarely ap appears, but the S ARP uh, is the another uh, bosonic partner of the ARP. Um, the, unfortunately, we didn't have our, uh, the introductory talk of dark matter, so let me uh, introduce uh, dark matter a bit more uh, in pedagogical way. So uh, I think all we know that is there have been accumulated evidences uh, of the dark matter uh, from the observation of the universe, and CMB is one of them. And the, uh, from these observations, uh, we know properties, like the dark matter should be long-lived, at least over the age of the universe, and it accounts for the 30% of the energy budget, present energy budget of the universe, and it only feebly interacting with the, our part, our, ourselves, I mean, photon, baryon, and dark matter should not be too hot, otherwise it smear out the primordial, uh, primordial density contrast that is expected to be generated by the inflation. And the, uh, so, but we don't know identity of dark matter. And in this line, uh, from kind of top, uh, sorry, top-down point of view, or precisely speaking, in the particle physics point of view, a uh, weakly interacting massive particle uh, has been a paradigm. The, this is basically because the, uh, we have the another reason in particle physics side to have a new particle in electroweak scale, uh, basically to as the origin of the electroweak symmetry breaking, and the, this new physics can provide dark matter candidate called the WIMP and naturally explain its correct relic abundance. I mean, explain why dark matter accounts for thirty percent of the energy budget of the universe. And in this line, we have the many attempts to find WIMPs. And unfortunately, there have been no convincing signal yet. <laughs> but the, first of all, the uh, particle physics itself faces the new tension. Uh, because the, uh, we expect that the, say, LHC uh, give us some hints of the origin of the electrosymmetry breaking, or the, I would say, TV scale new physics, or electroweak scale new physics. But we have not seen anything. Uh, except for the Higgs <laughs> itself. And so WIMP, I would say WIMP is the no more as miracle as expected in particle physics side or in from the pot, top, down, pot, from top down point of view. Uh, and there's some way in particle physics to think about the, what WIMP is, but uh, it's also a good time to think about in bottom up approach. And this is what I I explain uh, in this talk. So basically what I do, or what we do, uh, is to take a look at the structural formation of the universe to hint at uh, properties of dark matter. 
let me be more clear. Uh, the, in the structure formation, when we talk about structure formation of the universe, uh, we usually assume uh, cold dark matter. And here we assume that dark matter uh, uh, is highly non-relativistic and also collisionless and stable. And this assumption works very well uh, on the large scale structure formation of the universe, say the larger than the megaparsec scale. But the uh, question is if this assumption even works at the small scales, say the uh, kiloparsec scale. And we can just the change assumption one by one. So maybe dark matter is not so relativistic, and then we, t we talk about warm dark matter, or the mass of typically 1 keV. And we can talk about some dark matter interaction uh, with the radiation, say neutrino or the photon, uh, with this size of interaction. And then we have some change in the structure form small scale structure formation around the galactic scale. And we also can talk about the dark matter self-interaction, the interaction between dark matter particles and with one centimeter scale power gram. And then you also see some difference from cold dark matter in the galaxy scales. And if we doubt if dark matter is not, is not the truly stable or not, and then uh, what, this is what I di discuss in this talk, and late decaying dark matter. So basically, uh, late decaying dark matter is something like this. The mother particle decays into daughter dark matter particle. Mother dark matter particle decays into some daughter dark matter particle plus something else, with around the age of the universe. And this decay gives the stable dark matter particle with a uh, kick velocity. And this kick velocity are, and also lifetime are basic, basic parameter of this late decaying dark matter. And I'll basically talk about these two parameters. <laughs> and compared to other possibilities, this decaying dark matter is relatively new in this bottom up uh, dark matter field. And actually, there has be, this should be explored much more to say something very concrete. But instead, uh, I, I, in this talk, I uh, explain at least the state of Earth, our understanding uh, of this decaying dark matter and why it matters. <laughs> and the uh, okay. And the first, uh, I, let me explain a bit more about the particle physics side uh, of this decaying dark matter model. But. I don't think the many of you are interested in this particle physics side, so I just brief, only briefly. And the, in the second part, I explain the cosmological signatures uh, of this decaying dark matter. And this is the basic, I will introduce motivations to consider decaying dark matter model. And for example, this decaying dark matter model may solve the uh, so-called H not tension, the tension of the uh, H not parameter between the uh, high redshift observation or precisely CMB observation and the low redshift or supernovae uh, uh, with a measurement of the H now. And this also could solve the uh, so-called small scale issues, uh, which is a problem at galactic scale of the cold dark matter paradigm. So I mean that the cold dark matter may fail to explain uh, some structure uh, at the galactic scales. And the, this DDM could solve these things. And this is the motivation part. And as, uh, in the third part, I'll explain the, uh, how we can see uh, such scenario in more or less direct way. Although it's not completely direct, but the, what's the uh, kind of smoking gun signature of this scenario, I'll explain it. OK, and uh, just in two slides, let me introduce the particle physics side. Uh, the, when we talk about this the decaying dark matter, the first big constraint in particle physics side is this something else particle. This is mother dark matter particle and daughter dark matter particle. And we emit something uh, uh, to have this decay. And this particle should be uh, very light and also should be harmless. Because if this uh, particle strongly interacts with the, uh, the standard model particle, and then it, this kind of scenario is immediately excluded by uh, indirect detection experimental constraints. So we need to have some harmless particle. And for harmless particle, this action-like particle is the good candidate. And also from the uh, Suji side, this alpino mass, the ma daughter particle, or sorry, mother particle mass and daughter particle mass are, is naturally expected to be close to each other. 
Uh, although if these two mass are degenerate or not is up to your realization, but uh, anyway, these two are expected to be uh, close to each other. And once we admit these two particles are degenerate, and then lifetime is also in a good lifetime is also uh, in a good region within a more or less reasonable parameter uh, of the Suji psi. This is basically because this uh, uh, sorry axino decays into gravitino. Uh, occurs via the uh, Planck suppressed operator. So this is highly suppressed. And this is why the, uh, even with the 1 TeV uh, dark matter mass, we can have the, say, the, the lifetime around the edge of the universe. <laughs> so the uh, good side of this model is we can explain naturally why we have the uh, so long lifetime particle, so long lived particle, uh, with more or less reasonable Suji parameter. So this is a good, good uh, advantage from the particle physics side. So anyway, I'll talk about the uh, cosmological signature of with lifetime and kick velocity as free parameters. And the, uh, to give you an impression of this DDM, I, here I, draw, I take the, somewhat the uh, benchmark parameter of this DDM, the lifetime around the edge of the universe, and the kick velocity relatively close to the uh, speed of light. And the, in this case, the, uh, so this is the, uh, the evolution of the uh, matter density as a function of the scale factor. And decay happens around here. So this is why mother particle or liquid density drops around here. But the daughter particle or liquid density uh, goes up like this. <coughs> and the point is that uh, due to the small mass difference, the uh, asymptotic value of the mother particle relic density and daughter particle relic density is different. It's a bit suppressed by the factor, uh, by this factor of the kick velocity. So uh, in this case, uh, if we don't change the other cosmological parameters, and then basically matter density drops around here. And then Hubble expansion accordingly drops. So to keep a sensible cosmology, we need to increase the dark energy to keep the same or more or less same Hubble expansion rate. And then uh, in turn, uh, this gives us the higher uh, expansion rate at present. This is how this DDM can explain the so-called H0 tension. Let me be more clear. Uh, so this is the uh, expansion rate as a function of redshift and the uh, data points from the different uh, measurements. And the, in CDM case, please follow this, the bottom line uh, of this the gray one. And you go well at the high redshift and more or less fine uh, at the boss or this, the, uh, sorry, BAO observations. But you have a problem at redshift zero. I mean, compared to the uh, uh, in, lab, in lambda CDM, sorry, in lambda CDM, you have a tension of the H naught. The predicted uh, expansion rate of from the uh, lambda CDM determined by CMB is to say the 67 in this unit, but the uh, observation says the 73 or larger. This is what uh, people call the H0 tension. But if you introduce the, uh, this decaying dark matter and do the Monte Carlo analysis for these data sets, and then this red line gives you the uh, best of it or uh, the evolution of the expansion rate. And at the high rate, no difference from the original CDM. But in between, uh, it a bit uh, improved the fitting to the this BAO measurement and drastically improved uh, the uh, fitting to the low rate shift uh, H0 data. On the other hand, uh, so this is from this paper. On the other hand, I, I have one caveat. So please don't take this face value not so uh, <laughs> uh, significantly. I mean, because the, they don't care the uh, CMB itself. I mean, the, they only vary the, these two parameters uh, and also omega m, maybe. But the, they fix the other omega baryon and everything else by the CMB and don't care the uh, feedback <laughs> to the CMB parameter. Because the, you change the expansion rate or the low, low red shift, so you change the distance or the angular diameter distance to CMB. So we have to uh, consistently take into account this change in angular diameter distance itself, but this is what they, don't, they ignore. So actually we have to do more consistent analysis to infer 
uh, the best fit value of the, this DDM parameters. But anyway, this is the interesting direction and to be clarified. Uh, but the, from structural homogeneous point of view, the, uh, so this is just I explain the homogeneous expansion of the universe, but in, in, homogeneous, in homogeneity part, uh, this the DDM uh, with these parameters have a strong problem, may have a strong problem. I mean, the, you can calculate the genes ranks of the daughter particle, because daughter particle gets kicked from the, uh, uh, from the, through the decay of the mother particle, and this the kick can uh, prevent the structural formation of the universe at some certain scale. And by calculating genes scale, we can infer which scale structural formation happens well. And the genes scale uh, of the daughter particle is actually uh, in length larger than the uh, standard neutrino. And in the wave number, it's smaller than the, uh, okay, anyway, this, uh, uh, this the uh, kick affects the largest uh, scales of the structural homogeneous universe compared to the standard model neutrino. And you know that the standard model neutrino cannot be dark matter, or cannot account for the whole dark matter due, due to the same reason, because the standard model neutrino is too hot uh, to have a sensible uh, structural homogeneous of the universe. So from this point of view, actually, uh, this the DDM also has a problem to explain the structural homogeneous of the universe. <laughs> But if you uh, change this kick velocity a bit, so this kick velocity is very close to speed of light, but if you take the uh, smaller kick velocity, and then the situation gets milder, the, or because the genes length or the genes wave number gets uh, larger, so in length gets smaller. So in this case, the decaying dark matter uh, only affects the small scale of structure of the universe. And behaves as the, say, warm component uh, of dark matter. But the, actually, here's one caveat uh, on the uh, further statement, because sentinel neutrino cannot account for the whole, um, whole dark matter due to the, its hot dark matter, but it, it allows to account for the small, com small amount of the dark matter. And this is what the precisely standard model dark neutrino do. This is because the, uh, if yes, it has a hot component, but the, this component itself is very tiny or negligible. And then we don't have a problem to explain structural homogeneous of the universe. So the same thing happens are in this the, uh, decaying dark matter model. If you take the longer uh, lifetime, and then your impact on the structural formation gets uh, smaller. So you have this three line here for the same kick velocity and difference comes from the difference in the uh, uh, lifetime. So the shorter one and longer and longer. If you take a longer lifetime and then suppression becomes, uh, suppression of the linear matter per spectrum uh, gets milder and milder. So uh, unless we analyze, fully, fully analyze these, these say weak lensing data or the line alpha force data, we cannot say which parameter space is excluded. And this analysis has not been done yet, unfortunately. But this is also an interesting uh, thing we have to explore in the near future. <coughs> and the, uh, this plot shows the, OK, so I explained this one. And for this one, we fix the uh, lifetime, but changing kick velocity. So if you uh, decrease kick velocity, and then your suppression scale uh, go to small scales, as I explained. Okay, and when we take the uh, small scale uh, or the kick velocity of the 30 kilometer per second or 100 kilometer per second, something like that, and then what we could in principle solve is the so-called small scale issues. So first, please take a look at this figure. So uh, in lambda CDM model, uh, you can compare the uh, number of the small galaxies in Milky Way size halo. And this gives you the cumulative number of such small size halos. And this is the observed number of dwarf spheroidal galaxies, which are expected to be a counterpart of such small uh, sub halos uh, in simulation side. And as you can see, uh, the lambda CDM over predicts this number of the dwarf spheroidal galaxies by a factor of the actually 10 magnitude larger. 
And once you introduce this decaying dark matter model, and then the prediction of these, these small number, sm sorry, small size halos are reduced. This is basically because the once kick velocity wins or be, is larger than this, the uh, say linear velocity of this small size halo, and then dark matter basically evaporate from such small size halos. So this is how uh, this DDM can reduce the number of the small size halos. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, so, but for fixed uh, lifetime, if you increase this kick velocity, and then actually this effect saturated, this is basically because the once this kick velocity becomes larger than this the linear velocity, and then the effect is the same. Dark matter just evaporate. So the, it doesn't matter uh, what number for the kick velocity you take. But for fixed kick velocity, if you uh, change the lifetime, and then this matters for the prediction, because the, uh, this changes the fraction of the dark matter which experience the, uh, this decay, or the, you can say the, the probability of the decay. This changes. So if you take the, say, one giga year lifetime, and then almost all dark matter decay, or the experience decay uh, before at, until present, so it, you have drastic effect. But if you increase lifetime, and then your effect gets and milder and milder. <coughs> so anyway, so if you, you take the say of uh, comparing these two, if you take say 20 giga year lifetime and 20 kilometer per second kick velocity, and then more or less you can explain the observed dwarf radial number count. And this, the, uh, this also affects the, uh, the dark matter halo uh, density profile as well. This is the, uh, also what we call the cusp core problem in the lambda CDM. So in lambda CDM, so now please focus on the one sub halo and the uh, measure how dark matter distribute inside one sub halo. And then you found the cusp profile called say NFW profile in lambda CDM case. But again, you compared with the observationally inferred mass density profile in small size halos. So here I overplot several galaxies, and the uh, observation prefers more or less coward profile. When you go to center, the density profile gets flattened. This is what I mean by coward profile, compared to the uh, Caspi profile, or rather than Caspi profile. And the uh, again, <coughs> and because the uh, this kick velocity, uh, the, so the through the decay, dark matter gets the this velocity, kick velocity, and now kick velocity uh, moves the circular orbit of dark matter particle from inside to outside. So basically, this, this through the dark matter decay, uh, dark matter particle move from center to our, our outer region, and the, this is how the DDM can reduce central density of, of the uh, a dark matter halo and more or less can uh, explain the uh, observed, uh, dark, observed, uh, sorry, observed distribution of dark matter density. <coughs> and, and this is another example of small scale issues, too big to fail problem. So uh, let, again, <laughs> let me pick up the one Milky Way size halo from simulation. And you can plot the uh, velocity, say rotation curve, of each uh, small size halos within uh, one milky size halo and compare observation. The observational rotation curve coming, uh, coming like this, but the 10 or the 15 uh, biggest sub halos go above in terms of the circular velocity, which means that the, uh, these, if these sub halo exist, these sub halo fail to host some visible galaxy. And this is a bit uh, counterintuitive because the uh, biggest sub halos have a deepest uh, gravitational potential, which give a, a good test bet, which give a good bet or for the, the galaxy formation because baryon can well uh, follow the dark matter gravitational potential. But somehow they don't have the uh, visible galaxies. So there are several ways uh, to explain it. 
Of course, one possibility is that the same baryonic dynamics, like the uh, supernova feedback and so on, just erase, just prohibit the structure of, uh, sorry, galaxy formation from proceeding. And then we have some invisible dark matter subhalos, and that's all. That's all one possibility, but this is also somewhat controversial. I mean that there are several groups who perform the uh, simulations with the supernova feedback and so on. But the, their results are not concordant with each other, so we have to wait for, for them to have a converging result. And another way is changing the dark matter property, like the decaying dark matter. And if you have decaying dark matter, again, the dark matter particle move from central region to outside region, so it reduces the uh, central circular velocity and can explain the uh, observed rotation velocities in the dwarfs, uh, in the satellite Milky Way galaxies. <clears throat> so, here, yeah, so I explain many things, so let me summarize it in the one plot. So, lifetime and the kick velocity. <coughs> and anyway, uh, the, our interesting uh, lifetime is around the age of the universe, say the 10 gigahertz year to 100 gigahertz year. But the kick velocity should be tuned depending on which problem you are interested in. If you would like to explain the uh, uh, disagreement of the uh, measured value of H0, and then you have to take the kick velocity very close to speed of light. And actually, this region is already uh, more or less excluded by the, uh, the other observations, let's say, or like the Lima forest data, or the, uh, <coughs> sorry, Lima forest data. But the, uh, as I said, the, uh, the true parameter space, which can explain the H0 tension, should be explored by taking into account the CMB data itself uh, consist in a consistent manner. So this is why this inferred region is too huge. And we cannot conclude that the H0, this DDM can be a solution of H0 tension while satisfying the other constraints. And basically, the, again and again, this other constraint basically comes from the fact that this DDM behaves as a hot component uh, in the structure of formation of the universe. And if you uh, decrease this kick velocity, and then you satisfy this hot component constraints and come to small scale or structure formation region. So if you take this kick velocity around the 10 kilometer per second to 100 kilometer per second, and then now you can explain small scale issues. But unfortunately, uh, so far there are only limited number of the simulations which take into account this DDM. So I cannot precisely say in which parameter region uh, we can solve these small scale issues, but around this region, just, just only uh, roughly in fact in this plot. <coughs> and from the particle physics side, the, uh, as I stressed, uh, the uh, gravitational mass or the axial mass is in the good range of our interest, say 1 GB to 1 PEB. So electroweak scale Suji uh, gives us the correct parameter space for the EDM. So in the last the, uh, seven or eight minutes, let me explain how to see it in this model. <coughs> so compared to the, uh, this, the uh, mother particle mass, here I plot the uh, energy of the emit uh, action-like particle. It, ranges from the 100 MeV to 5 GeV. So basically, uh, this, this decay of the mother ALP, uh, sorry, mother action like particle uh, to the gravitino uh, gives us the GeV range uh, action-like part, action particle flux. And this, the flux is actually very high because the, uh, if we take the uh, lifetime around the age of the universe, and then all the dark matter, the all the dark matter emit this axion like particle. So this flux is actually 10, 10 to 6 times higher than the observed gamma ray flux. <coughs> so if we, if, so even this, the action like particle feebly interacting uh, with standard model particles, we have a big chance to see it. On, or in other words, if you think about the, some, the uh, DDM model with the mother particle decays into the daughter particle by emitting photon, and then it's already excluded by the Fermilat experiment because the flux is too high. 
And one possibility to see such the background action-like particle flux is a conversion of the action-like particle to the photons through galactic magnetic field. The under the magnetic field, uh, generically, uh, the action-like particle is converted to photon. So the, if this conversion probability is the larger than 10 to minus 6, and then it's excluded, basically, because, the, we, have the high, because we have the high flux, and even only tiny component is the converted to photon, and then we have intention with the uh, uh, observed gamma ray e flux. <coughs> and unfortunately, we have not seen this the uh, signal yet uh, in the Fermilat data. But once it's identified, and then uh, we can really discriminate this kind, of, this type of the uh, scenario from the other the just decaying dark matter type, decaying dark matter scenario, just usual one. I mean that the, <laughs> because the uh, morphology is different from the, the purely dark matter decaying into photon one, and this the uh, ALP converted to photon. This is because the, for the purely dark matter decaying into photon case, the, uh, this morphology, I mean that the, how the signal looks like over the sky, is only determined by the dark matter density profile. So it's concentrated in the central region, the galactic center, and the flux gets lower and lower if you go uh, the, the outer region. But in this case, in this the action-like particle case, uh, this morphology is a convolution of the galactic magnetic field and dark matter distribution. So still, the uh, flux is the really center at uh, the galactic center, but the if you go to this direction or this direction, this matters. <laughs> For example, if you go this direction in the halo, and then you see the sharp drop of the flux, but if you go this direction and then the flux doesn't uh, fall off uh, so rapidly. So once we identify this signal, and then we can say this is the uh, this uh, axino, sorry, ALPino, decays into gravitino and emit ARP, ARP is converted to photon. This is the interesting part. And the, here's the one parameter plot, and the, this is the action decay constant, basically, one over action decay constant, and this is the action like particle mass. So if this action is QCD action, uh, fortunately, this is much below the current constraint from this gamma ray observation, or in other words, unfortunately, we cannot see it in near future. But the, uh, if we generalize this scenario in the general action model, and then maybe we could see uh, such signal. Let me skip this other one. So let me summarize the, my talk. So uh, I consider the decaying dark matter uh, where the kick velocity and lifetime as a free parameter. And this is very, not relatively actually, very really bottom up approach because we somehow introduce phenomenological parameters. But the, uh, in from particle physics side, we have a good model to uh, uh, realize this the uh, uh, parameter space, and this is the Arpino, uh, sorry, Arpino and Gravitino system. And in cosmology side, uh, this uh, phenomenology of this decaying dark matter is rather complicated but interesting. And, and the, if you take the uh, this kick velocity close to speed of light, and then the change in expansion rate of the universe is, is sizable. And it may solve the RH not tension. And even if you take the small kick velocity, like say 10 kilometer per second, but still this number is larger, uh, is large enough compared to the uh, video velocity of the small size galaxies. And this changes the uh, structure of the dark matter in such uh, galactic scale object and may solve the small scale issues. <coughs> and the, so far everything is gravitational, but the uh, advantage of this scenario is that the, this action, Arpino decays into gravitino plus ARP, and this ARP flux is very high. And the only a tiny conversion of the ARP into the photon uh, we can, uh, <coughs> can be seen or in the uh, gamma ray experiments, like the Fermilat. So thank you very much.
for your final remark about uh, the photon, uh, yeah, cameric blocks from a uh, photon conversion. So what is the uh, expectation uh, from, for example, drop galaxies or just an extra galaxy? <coughs> What do you mean by expect? Mm -hmm. Uh, the because the com because of because the conversion probability gets reduced uh, when the uh, magnetic field strength is reduced. So actually, uh, if you go the to the uh, outside our galaxy, and then uh, the conversion probability itself is reduced. But the uh, for example, when you uh, okay here, I consider the uh, lifetime around the edge of the universe. But if the uh, the lifetime is much shorter than the age of the universe. And then the main uh, source of the alpha flux itself is the, sorry, extra galactic. And in such a case, we inevitably to see the uh, diffuse gamma ray signal. But the uh, problem is, again, the uh, magnetic field strength is not so high. So that is another big difference between just um, direct decay and yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, uh, concerning that point, I would like to give you one more caveat. So uh, here I use the one model of, of the galactic magnetic field, but surprisingly, or not surprisingly, galactic magnetic field is not well constrained by observations. So actually the different model gives you clearly different the uh, morphology. So, uh, and I think the, the same problem uh, basically applies even if we go to extra galactic because it highly depends on how magnetic field are uh, distributed over the sky. And first of all, we have to know it very precisely. So in the case where you want to solve the Haitian problem, you essentially convert some of the dark matter to radiation. Basically, at, yes, yes, yes. At uh, low redshift. Yeah. Um, how does that agree with data sets that are sensitive to the amount of dark matter at low redshift? So, for instance, lensing. For instance, ranging. Ah, yeah. So, uh, I think I see. Actually, uh, weak lensing is expected to, uh, you mean the, sorry, lensing or? Galaxy weak lensing or CMD lensing. Ah, uh, okay, okay, I, I got to mean. That's quite sensitive to omega m. Yes. Uh, yeah, but the point is that, uh, actually, uh, we don't combat all dark matter energy due to this small kick velocity. Oh, let me, yeah, let me show it. So the uh, in usual decaying dark matter model, or this, uh, basically dark matter decays into radiation. So the, the, there is no dark matter after the decay. But in this case, we have the uh, massive daughter particle. So only a very uh, small amount, say a few percent, is converted to the, uh, the radiation. So omega m drops slightly. But not completely. In, in this scenario, it drops by a half, roughly. In this case, yes. In this case, yes. Depending on your kick velocity. Exactly. I mean, that, that was my question. Because mm -hmm. if, if you want to solve the H0 problem, you need to change the expansion history. Yes. And therefore, you need to um, convert a significant amount of dark matter into radiation. Yes, yeah, significant. Yeah, I mean, say 10%, yeah, for example. Uh, the. Actually, weak lensing signal or is expected one is expected to give a very strong constraint on this scenario, but unfortunately, it has not been done yet. Analysis has not been done yet, so this is what we have to do. Actually, the uh, so what we show in the previous slide is the lifetime of the say ten to hundred, 
and I say it's not around here. And this is the uh, Fisher, I think the Fisher, yeah, okay. Anyway, this is the project sensitivity for DES. I know DES already come, but at this time it's still projected our uh, project. And, and it fully covers the, uh, this, the, the uh, interesting region for its not tension. But the problem is, again, the, no one did it yet, <laughs> the full analysis. It's also an interesting point, because this may also solve the sigma problem in the, say, weak ranging survey. But actually, the, uh, the one technical issue is that it's not easy to uh, follow the evolution of DDM, actually. <laughs> it's much complicated to compare to cold dark matter. So for given cosmological parameter, to get prediction, it takes time. So doing Monte Carlo simulation is much worse. Yeah, anyway, this is a technical problem we have to overcome soon, yeah. Thank you for introduction. Uh, let me thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so this talk is about a bouncing universe scenario. And, but this is not an alternative to an inflation scenario because uh, in our framework, the last expansion phase is actually an inflationary expansion phase. And this, uh, uh, so basically we find some cosmological solutions, homogeneous and isotropic cosmological solutions in which the universe initially expands and then contracts and then uh, bounces back to expansion, re-expansion again. Uh, this is not based on some uh, a priori phenomenological motivation or something like that, but we somehow found these solutions and found it interesting purely theoretically. We could also discuss the uh, several implications, but anyway, so this is about some theoretical talk. And so, yeah, I made this logo. The universe expands, contracts, and expands again. And possibly this scenario may well fit into the framework of creation of the universe from nothing proposed by Wiedenkin or a uh, related scenario proposed by Hartle and Hawking. The, the so-called uh, no boundary proposal of the universe. And I do not introduce any uh, violation of null energy condition, nor encountering singular curvature singularities or, and so on. So this is just based on uh, the standard gravity, Einstein gravity and uh, real canonical scalar field. So uh, as you know, the universe is expanding, but uh, we do not know what exactly happened at the very beginning of the universe and also what will happen in the very distant future. Uh, a question is, is the universe always expanding? Usually the answer is yes. So let's start with a simple assumption of the flat universe. Then in, in this case, uh, the Friedman equation says that the expansion of the universe, the Hubble parameter h, is given by the energy density of the universe. And uh, as you see, if the energy density is positive, then if initially the universe is expanding, then it keeps expanding forever. But uh, once this row, the energy density vanishes, then Hubble vanishes. So at that moment, the expansion stops. And at that moment, because of this, uh, another freedom equation uh, uh, describing the evolution of Hubble, time derivative of Hubble, uh, this is non-positive under the null energy condition. So general, generally, under that very uh, general assumption, 
uh, if it stops expansion, then it contracts. And in what kind of situation this uh, vanishing energy density or vanishing Hubble is realized? This is, for example, if we consider a scalar field theory where, where the scalar potential has a negative potential part like this. So in this case, for example, uh, scalar field initially oscillates around its minimum, and because of cosmic friction, the amplitude decreases gradually. And at some point, the total energy of this scalar field uh, and this negative energy balances, and then at, at that time, Hubble vanishes, and then universe contracts. So contraction is possible, but the problem is that once it happens, the universe keeps contracting, and eventually it will go to a big crunch. Of course, we do not conclude it be because if it becomes very high energy, then we have to know uh, some high energy physics knowledge or quantum gravity. But anyway, the universe keeps contracting, contracting to very, very high energy state. Now, some of you uh, may feel that this negative energy is uh, uncomfortable, but actually it exists in, even in a standard model. So this is a renormalization group running of the self-coupling of the Higgs boson. And this suggests that there is a, our, our electric vacuum is metastable to some precision. And uh, through vacuum, we'll have a deeper or negative minimum. And also, if we go to some high energy physics theories like supergravity or superstring theories, then uh, usually the uh, vacuum is, uh, has a negative energy, negative energy density, the so-called ADS vacuum. And then one has to uh, break supersymmetry to uplift the vacuum energy to a positive uh, vacuum. However, it is very difficult, notoriously difficult, to construct such kind of dosita vacua with positive energy. And recently, some people argue that dosita construction is actually impossible in string theory. Anyway, I do not discuss this in, in detail, but the, the message is that the negative energy is much more natural in this context. So once you, or we accept this negative energy density vacuum, then we can imagine that in a cosmological context, the scalar field goes into the negative region of the potential. Then once it happens, as I said, the universe contracts. So the question is that, is the big crunch an avoidable consequence or not? So this is a kind of an important question. So far, I just introduced a flat space. And even if we uh, uh, restricted ourselves to the homogeneous and isotropic universe, the simplified setup, uh, we can still consider spatial curvature effect. This can be positive or negative or vanishing corresponding to a closed universe or open universe or flat universe. So the, these freedom equations are now augmented with these curvature, spatial curvature terms. And, uh, so now we are, want to consider the uh, possibility that the contracting universe, uh, whether it may bounce, bounce it back to uh, expansion phase. And this is uh, possible in a toy model, for example. If we just consider a positive cosmological constant and a positive spatial curvature, then there is a solution that uh, scale factor evolves like hyperbolic cosine. This means that initially it uh, contracts and then at times t equals zero, it bounces and then expands again. So if this kind of situation is, uh, for example, uh, approximately realized, this contraction to expansion is possible. This uh, conversion is possible. So from now on, we want to use this kind of mechanism, combine, combine these uh, mechanisms to uh, construct a scenario in which the universe expands, contracts, and expands again. Uh, so before I introduce some uh, concrete scalar potential, for example, uh, I just uh, explained the qualitative feature. Um, the setup is uh, this simple one, the general relativity with the Einstein-Hilbert term and the real and canonical 
physical sign, scalar, uh, scalar field. Kinetic term, and this is the scalar potential, something like this. This is just a summary of the equation of motion with spatial curvature term. And we have in mind uh, this kind of shape of the scalar potential. There is a, a negative minimum, and away from this minimum, the scalar potential is assumed to be flat, flatter. Now there, is, there are three stages, first expansion and then contraction phase and the final inflationary expansion. So I will explain one by one. The first one is the initial expansion phase. This is basically the same as the very standard expansion cosmology. Uh, suppose that the initial state is, has a positive energy and positive Hubble expanding and positive, uh, yeah, positive potential. And then imagine that scalar field oscillates around like this, so uh, around its minimum. And suppose that the initially the spatial curvature effect is negligible and positive. Then at some point, because of uh, cosmic friction, uh, the amplitude of the scalar field oscillation decreases. And then at some time, this energy balances with this uh, spatial curvature term. So at that time, as I said, H vanishes, and then H dot is negative because this kinetic term is uh, dominant. So H becomes negative. This means that the universe contract, starts to contract. In this, in this second phase, the Hubble is negative because it's contracting. So this is the cosmological uh, Hubble friction becomes a negative friction or anti-friction. So this accelerates the amplitude of the uh, scalar field oscillations, its amplitude grows. And here there is a crucial assumption. Uh, if the kinetic energy of scalar field is sufficiently suppressed when this comes to uh, a plateau part, flat part, then uh, in that situation, the positive curvature uh, can make the universe expand again. Because now, if the kinetic energy is negligible around here, then it's like just a cosmological constant, effectively cosmological constant. Then it's similar to the previous toy, toy example, so the balance is possible. Okay. And for example, the, after the balance, there is an expansion phase, but uh, note that we assume the flat part of the potential for the purpose of the balance, and this same uh, ingredient naturally let the universe enter into the slow roll inflation regime. So this is not an extra assumption, but kind of same, same setup. Uh, so of course we need to assume this plateau part is sufficiently long, then this inflation can last sufficiently long. Then it can be consistent with our observations if this negative minimum has a positive one, tiny cosmological constant. So even though the cosmology is very non-trivial, it can be consistent with observations. So now let's discuss concrete uh, numerical simulation. This is a scalar potential I uh, assumed. Uh, so its figure is depicted here. It's uh, like inflationary model of Starominsky potential or Higgs inflation model or alpha tractor. The hyperbolic tangent shape is uh, in the, uh, obtained in the case of alpha tractor type models, but the exact functional form is not so important. So uh, here the qualitatively important thing is that uh, it has a uh, relatively flat part. And this is the numerical result. The horizontal axis is the conformal time, the normalized one. And the vertical axis, uh, so please look at this uh, magenta line. This is the logarithm of the scale factor. So it initially increases, namely the universe expands, and then it decreases. So universe contracts, shrinks, and there is a bounce, and then expand again. And actually, this is an inflationary expansion because the, actually the condition of the inflation and 
is condition for accelerated expansion. And accelerated expansion is nothing but the condition for bounce at this point. So far, I just input the positive spatial curvature, but let's discuss some possible origin of spatial curvature, positive spatial curvature. Uh, there is uh, some interesting cosmological scenario uh, which is based on a positive spatial curvature. For example, it is a creation of the universe from nothing, which is proposed by Virenkin. Uh, I will briefly uh, describe it in one slide. So in this scenario, the uh, universe, uh, to describe it, uh, uh, we uh, assume the uh, homogeneous assumption, uh, homogeneity assumption. So this is called uh, so-called uh, mini superspace approximation. The wave function of the universe is uh, a function of scalar factor and homogeneous scalar field. And uh, uh, this is uh, basically the Schrodinger equation, but this is now the time invariant system. So it's a reparameterization invariant constraint. And this is called wheeler dewitt equation. And in terms of uh, concrete expression, this is very similar to the, the undergraduate level Schrodinger equation, one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. So we can uh, use some analogy. This is a uh, potential for this, uh, yeah, this potential for this uh, Schrodinger problem. The horizontal axis is the scale factor, and the vertical axis is the potential. And suppose that initially there is no universe, namely nothing. I mean the size of the universe is zero. Classically, it cannot expand from zero, zero size, because there is a potential barrier. However, we know that in quantum mechanics, there is a process of quantum tunneling. So this is the idea of the creation of the universe from nothing. Namely, uh, it suddenly emerges as a finite size. And the crucial thing is that this scenario is based on a, sp a positive spatial curvature. And uh, so this is kind of an um, instant on process, and uh, we basically expect some homogeneous and isotropic creation of the universe. And so that's why our scenario may fit very well into this kind of scenario. First of all, uh, this is based on positive spatial curvature, and also this may explain the homogeneity and isotropy of the initial state of the universe. Now, we. In the different parts of parameter space, we found even cyclic solutions of the universe. It expands, contracts, expands, contracts uh, again and again. Again, we take this uh, scalar potential as an example, but now this, uh, these parts are irrelevant, so I put these parameters zero. So, it's, uh, so it does not involve negative potential, but basically, we take uh, this alpha, the width of the potential, much narrower than the previous example, and then uh, take the initial conditions uh, suggested by the creation of the universe from nothing possibility. Then this is the uh, one solution of the uh, cyclic universe. The horizontal axis is the normalized conformal time, and the vertical axis is the scale factor. Oh, okay. So let me summarize. Uh, we find new non-trivial cosmological solutions, like uh, possibly initially uh, initial state may be creation of the universe from nothing, and then it expands initially, and then turns into a contraction phase. For example, due to the negative potential, and it bounces back to inflationary expansion. So because this is not just expansion, but inflationary expansion, it can be consistent with observations if this inflation is long enough. And with different parameter choices, we find also cyclic solutions of the universe. Uh, so this, uh, we want to emphasize that this is within the four-dimensional Einstein gravity and the real canonical scalar field. The canonical scalar field may be a uh, non-minimal in ingredient, but 
this is also necessary for inflation. So this framework is a kind of very standard one. And there is no violation of null energy condition. Note that many scenarios of balancing cosmology uh, violate these kind of conditions. And some balancing scenarios assume uh, scalar field vanishes or the energy density becomes infinite. But in our case, uh, there is no such singularities. So this leads to very interesting possibilities. And today, I focused on a possibility that our universe experienced such kind of non-trivial uh, uh, dynamics. But this could occur in a future of our universe. If the parameters of the scalar potential or initial conditions are suitably tuned. So in that sense, it, it's not so likely. Or, uh, but anyway, this is a logical possibility. So there are many things to be explored. So uh, there is still five minutes. So I show some discussion slide and stop here. Thank you for your attention. Uh, when the curvature is zero, then it's uh, impossible because our mechanism relies on a, crucially on the positive spatial curvature. For example, uh, yeah, for for the bounce to occur at the at the time of the bounce, h again becomes zero, and at at that time, h dot must be positive for for the for the bounce to occur. However, if there is no curvature, positive curvature, then there is only a negative semi-definite term in this, in this scalar field theory. So the positive curvature is crucial. Strong energy condition is violated. So that uh, equation of state singularity parameter does not happen. Singularity does not happen. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, we are worrying about whether that violation is serious or not. Hmm? The so strong energy you may condition. Use your scalar field system is not so realistic because of the violation. I mean, violation of strong energy condition. Strong energy condition. But it's violation, I mean, the strong energy condition is that W is less than, uh, the vi uh, its violation is uh, W is less than minus one third, right? Uh, but it's, if it's uh, non-realistic, then inflation is also unrealistic. So it's the uh, same level. If inflation is acceptable, then this kind of uh, part is acceptable. Okay, um, okay, then let me start with this one. So uh, you are considering some, this kind of uh, a period after the inflation? Uh, before the inflation, or, or uh, the basically Big before. Bang. Yeah. Hmm? After, the sun, after the Big Bang. For example, a uh, universe possibly created from nothing and uh, on the, this side of plateau, then it expands and contracts and ex and here it becomes uh, experiences inflation. Uh -huh. So before inflation, or now we are around here dark energy, and the dark energy decays because of this shape of the potential. And in future, the universe may contract and bounces back. So there are two possibilities. Okay, then uh, suppose such thing happened. What, what 
the observational consequence. Oh. Uh, whether you know, our observations can rule out uh, those things or it's a limit. Yeah, it's an important question. And but if the uh, so if this inflation is sufficient, uh, just enough for uh, explaining our universe, then we may see the effect of positive spatial curvature. Now it's uh, uh, constrained by data. It's consistent with zero, but if we look at only the Planck data, uh, uh, it's consistent <laughs> with positive spatial curvature. Of course, if we add lensing and BL, it's totally consistent with vanishing curvature. But so if we, I don't know, maybe precise measurement of the spatial curvature will tell us something about our universe. I guess another prediction is that dark energy cannot be detected from the Yeah, if this uh, scalar field is uh, related to dark energy, yes. But it has to be. You can't have a positive um, cosmological constant because then the minimum wouldn't be negative. Uh, so, for example, if we can, we can imagine that. If we are now in this minimum, and if this, there is a cosmological constant, tiny cosmological constant, then it's, it's also a possibility. In that case, there is no quintessence, but just a cosmological constant here. Ah yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I didn't emphasize today, but uh, actually some kind of tuning is necessary. Uh, this is related to the fact that the uh, kinetic energy tends to dominate in a contracting universe uh, because it grows like one over scale factor to the sixth power. So we have to uh, tune the initial uh, kinetic energy to be very small. For example, in this example, I take the parameter alpha here, 1, beta 0, and gamma is minus 0 0.09143. This is because uh, without this level of fine tuning, uh, I, I didn't find this kind of behavior. So some digits of tuning is necessary for fixed initial condition. Uh, in that case, the scalar field uh, starts from here and goes here, and then kinetic term uh, increases very much, and either scalar field goes infinity in a finite time, or it go goes back here and uh, go to the uh, uh, go to the other side in a finite time. So the universe uh, cr leads to a big crunch in a finite time because of increasing kinetic energy of this scalar field. The fine tuning is small if this uh, inflationary, uh, yeah, this uh, contraction and expansion is short, but if this is uh, assumed to be long, then fine tuning is, should be long, uh, uh, significant. If there is some fluctuation during contraction period, there will be every point, so maybe breakdown over the whole universe. Yes, I agree. So uh, the fluctuations, some type of fluctuations uh, have the scaling of A to minus 6, similarly to the kinetic term. So the initial uh, perturbations should be assumed to be very small, or otherwise there is a maximum uh, duration of this uh, contraction. 
possibly creation of the universe from nothing may explain such kind of uh, homogeneous homogeneity, initial homogeneity.